Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Bay. Hi there. This is episode 151 of our beekeeping show. Do you have to keep bees warm over winter? Yes, and in this Q&A show we answer questions about keeping bees warm, mites, robbing bees and pesky wasps. And there was a little one there about dumbass. <laughs> there was. What's that about? We are Gary and Margaret. We are Kiwi Mana, and Kiwi Mana are beekeepers from the hills of the Waitaki Ranges on the wild west coast of Auckland in the North Island of New Zealand. Yes, we build and sell beekeeping equipment and bees provide beekeeper services and education. Yes, and every new subscriber that joins our free beekeeping newsletter is asked, what's your biggest beekeeping problem? And in this show, we endeavour to answer some of those burning questions. Yeah, some of those questions that are buzzing around in your head. This is true. Thanks for joining us today. We appreciate you've taken the time to have a listen. And the show was made by the help, with the help of our supporters. Absolutely. And the show notes for this podcast are kiwi.bz slash 151. Okay, next question is keeping bees warm over winter. This is a message from Janice. What does Janice say? Janice says, this is my first year renting a beehive. We live in town. My beekeeper is holidaying in warmer climes for several weeks. How do I keep my beehive warm? Thought of wrapping bubble wrap around it. My husband is quite scathing of my babying of the beehive. But beekeeper said the hive had gone back faster than he had anticipated and put a nuke on top of the box. I would hate to lose my bees. Hmm. A nuke on top of the box? What does that mean? Is that part of the hive, or is it just a box on top of the of the hive? I don't understand that. I think it's it may be that he's put a nuke on top so that the colony will keep warm and will keep growing through winter. I've heard of people doing nukes through winter on top of another hive. Oh, you mean putting a, a another colony with a, a nuke box above this one? Yeah, I, I that's my assumption. And the other thing is, is that generally bees keep themselves warm, and our job is to keep the hive wear dry. Yeah, absolutely. They don't really. I mean, I'm not sure where Janice is, but in New Zealand, you don't really need to wrap your hives because, in some, in some people could say that's the worst thing to do because it actually it actually keeps the moisture inside the hive, at least if it's. Yeah. Not wrapped, the moisture comes out through the wood and stuff. Yeah, I think that the bees need to be able to have some way to ventilate the hive because if there is a colony in there, the bees themselves will keep warm, but they will generate a lot of heat and it's the heat hitting colder surfaces or not being able to draw out the moisture. And as soon as you get moisture in the hive, then you are going to get condensation, which can create black mould, which is not good for inside a beehive. And if they've got varroa in that area as well, if she's not on top of that, then the problem is is that it could sort of multiply. So it sounds to me that the hive was already at risk before the guy went away. So I would have been... You know, I would have recommended for her to go in and get someone to look in the hive for her while he's away, just to make sure. What makes you say that that it was at risk? She said that the beekeeper said the hive had gone back faster than he anticipated. Oh, okay. So that's why he put the nuke on top. So my thought is that there was something not 100%. The other thing I would say would be food. You know, is there enough food in there? And We have heard of people in countries where the temperature gets below zero that they do actually thermally wrap the hives. Yeah, a lot of people have those um, poly hives as well. They're quite popular, aren't they? Yeah, we've seen them in Germany. We have. We've seen them in Auckland too. I mean, some people are here. (laughs) And they didn't live long. They're just too hot. I I wouldn't bother. I, I would just make sure that the... The entrance is reduced and just make sure they've, the guys made sure that the population has been reduced down, you know, like you don't have a five box hive for a little colony, so you've got to just reduce them down. But he, he should have done all that before he went on to 
is holiday. So hopefully that those bees are still going strong and they're coming out coming into spring now. So yeah, get back to us, Janice, and tell us how you got on with them. Okay, the next question is Bloody Varroa mites. Mites, mites, mites. They wiped me out this year. This is from James Roger. Well, you've got to uh you've got to monitor. You've got to treat if you treat them, and I, I, we recommend you do. We use organic treatments. If you've listened to our podcast for any length of time, you'll know all about that. So, I mean, you just got to be on top of them. They can reproduce a lot faster than the bees sometimes, can't they? Yeah, James, I think that just step back a bit and have a look at what has happened inside the hive and what's left. So... If there are a lot of mites and you think it's all down to mites, it takes only a few weeks for mites to actually get in the hive. So let's say, for example, I'll just give you an example of how this could happen. So a bee goes out and forages and there's a varroa mite on the flower it lands on. Then the varroa mite jumps onto the bee and then the bee goes home and gets into the hive and the varroa is just in heaven and it jumps on to another bee and then that bee goes to the brood area and then the varroa, because instinctually is, is very aware, goes to where there are cells with Larvae and they know where those cells are by smell, eh? It's smell and vibration and all that kind of thing. And then what happens if there's new eggs in the hive, which we have in Auckland, we have brood nearly year round, but in other areas it may not be year round, it may close down brood or laying. But say you don't do anything about that mite that's come into the hive, right? And then the queen's laying, and so on the fourth day, the eggs become larvae, and then on the eighth day, they're growing quite big, the larvae, and that's the day where the varroa will actually go into the cell because they instinctually know that it's going to be capped. And if the bees aren't doing a lot of house cleaning or are not too well from previous varroa, they will not clean out that cell and the varroa will procreate within that cell once the cap has gone on. So therefore, the varroa will start feeding on the larvae. The first thing that the varroa does, it's a female, the the sort of the ready, roundy, one is the female and she will lay a male egg, a male egg, a male varroa. So then she'll mate with that male varroa. Ooh. Yeah, not the best. And then they will produce offspring and then they will do the feces. They will excrete waste in the cell. They will also then attach themselves to the larvae and start feeding off the larvae. And then through that process, they will start to transfer virus load. And so then the larvae inside is there from 9 days to 21 days. So it's a two-week process, very short time from being capped to hatching that the varroa is in there transferring the viruses. And then when the bee hatches, the varroa will emerge at the same time that the bee hatches. And if that varroa is nice and healthy, which it will be, it will then go and find another cell. So the Yeah, and they have about four or five mites every time, don't they? I heard the, they've got a high death rate. The, what I understand is that in the worker brood, they only lay one and they only can manage to raise one progeny, as it were. But if it's in a drone um, cell, they can lay up to three surviving varroa. But some may die. 
especially if there's sort of existing treatments in there. But if you're an organic beekeeper and you are treating, you have to keep reapplying, unfortunately. But going back to the timing of things, you think about it, if the bee brings the varroa and it goes into a cell within that few days, then from the ninth day to the 21st day to create a whole lot of problems is is within 14 days. Mm. So if you're not treating, if you're organic, then yes, you're going to have lots of mites. And then from there, when that bee hatches, that bee will spread viruses because it will start feeding. It'll, its first job will be a nurse bee, and it will start feeding viruses to the new larvae and eggs that are in there. So it's not a good thing, eh? No. So that's what's happened. And, the, and you know, that could have been, that problem could have been in there for, you know, four weeks. So you think about it if they're going to lay a whole lot of, you know, winter bees and then you get a whole lot of new cat brood going into winter and if every cell's full of varroa, you're going to have an absolute uh, nightmare once hatch in two weeks. Yeah, and the other thing is you're going to have winter bees that are, are unhealthy because they may have viruses and stuff. Exactly, exactly. You got it, Gary. And then from there, it's just like within a month, the whole hive will be gone. It's as simple as that. Yeah, so keep an eye on them, James. That's my our advice, isn't it? Yeah, the, the key is to understand what is the cycle of the bee, what is the cycle of the varroa, and monitoring is really important and having some kind of integrated pest management program that you will regularly use to monitor and look after your hive. Know thy enemy. And also, if you don't know what's in your hive and you just assume stuff, it won't help. And if you're using whatever treatment, you still need to monitor. Yep, I agree. I mean, even if you're not treating, which is not advisable, but you should at least still monitor to see when they get to a level where the mites don't increase anymore or if they keep just increasing. Hey. Yeah, the thing is you won't notice it until it's too late. By the time, by the time you start seeing deformed wing bees, That has been going on for about three weeks at least, Mm. you know, because that's that's a whole cycle of the bee growing inside the cell to emerging, I mean, to hatching time. And if you don't catch it at that point and there's new eggs in there, the whole cycle's happening really quickly. So, yeah. The reality is is that just looking at the hive is not going to help. But by the time you see it, It'll be too late. No, I mean monitor with a with a like a sugar shake or an alcohol wash, not just look at them. That's just crazy. Well, there's a there's you know, the cycle of the seasons, a lot of people don't take notice of that, but the seasons are very important to understand what is going on with your bees through the seasons. And that's one of the classes I'm gonna be doing, Gary. I know, people can learn from Margaret. So yeah, get in yeah. get out there and do that. Anyway, I'm sad to hear that you've lost your hives. Better luck next time, I guess, eh? Well, use it as a learning experience, James, and then move forward from there. Okay, dealing with robbing bees. This is from Jackie. And Jackie says, Trying to get a hive of mine started from Manuka in a large valley of bush, Manuka and Kanuka, with hundreds of commercial hives in the same valley. After three years, I finally have a strong hive that seems to be able to deal robbing bees. Tried various methods to prevent robbing, but would appreciate hearing more. She says, no one appears to be winter feeding the commercial hives. So when I feed mine, a Langstroth deep frame feeder, no spillage, it came under attack until recently which I suppose could be other food sources have begun. Plus, it is now one and a half brood boxes strong. Well, Jackie, I want to give you a medal. That is fantastic. Fantastic. Personally, I would use one of those top feeders rather than a deep frame feeder because it's probably a bit gets closer to the entrance. Have they? Did you reduce the entrance? Hopefully you did. And maybe... May even made a robbing screen or bought a robbing screen from these these guys called Kiwi Mana. 
it's very difficult when you've got commercial beehives near you and they're all robbing your hives, but, you know, you, you just got to have strong hives, don't you? Yeah, I think you, you've got it right there that you have to have a strong colony to be able to withstand any kind of threat. Entrance reduction is one thing. It can, even if you do it down to two B sides, you can still get a hive robbed out. So, you know, strong hives survive better. Yeah, I agree that perhaps the feeding side of things could be done in a top feeder with an extra hive mat with a slot in it so that the bees can get up there and feed, but then it won't chill down the brood box if it's a wintering thing. And maybe have the slot at the back so that the robbing bees would have to go through the colony to get to it so they get yeah. more, more resistance. That's an interesting idea, Gary. Well, that's your idea, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, no, I think, well done, Jackie, and uh, yeah, you need to share your method with lots of people. Yeah, and that hive you've got that's strong that can withstand the robin bees, I would breed like crazy from it. I think doing a, a, a preemptive split before you start to get any swarm cells and take the old queen away and put her aside and let her carry on, don't lose many resources to her, give her good uh, resources and then do the split let them raise the new queen and then only use the new season colony for any more splits so the other older queen will carry on and she will have continued um, foraging and that kind of thing so that will help going forward for you to so that you have those good genetics but you know don't over split with the original queen keep her if you can because she'll be a good queen going forward yeah and the next story is kind of related it's from mike and he says he just simply says wasps yeah when wasps become a problem dealing with the wasps and robbing bees on the hive are quite similar but obviously wasps are after the protein aren't they as well as the sweetness depending on the time of the year um, but you, yeah. I would get some kind of robbing screen and the other thing you've got to do is just hunt down the wasp nests yeah, I think you really do have to identify where the wasps are coming from. They won't be too far away, but just far enough to make it a problem. But yeah, I I agree with you, Gary. Identify the where the wasps are coming from and exterminate. Exterminate. Exterminated! Exterminated! Yes, as the Daleks used to do. The thing is, is same with what Jackie was asking. And the same with wasps is that if the hive is weak, they are more vulnerable to all sorts of threats. So I think that wasps also like it when the hives are down lower on the ground. Yeah, because they kind of like hover on the ground. They like they like move along the bottom of the, on the ground level, eh? Yeah, they seem to do that now, Apri, and and if there's bees that are just dying naturally and they fall on the ground, then the wasps will clean that up. But then they try to come into the hive, fly up and go into the hive. But if there's stuff on the ground, they will just feed around there. But we have robbing screens for our colonies and we use them year round. And they make a big difference, absolutely. But the key to both robbing bees and wasps is to have healthy hives. Okay, next question. Self-deprecating beekeeper. Now, this is from Mike. Mike, you can't give yourself a hard time. His his biggest problem is one dumbass beekeeper, me. Lots of laughs. Well, Mike, I think I know that we were all dumbasses at some stage, and I was one of them. And even today, I still get things wrong. So, you know, it's learning from those things and not, Keep banging your head against the wall if something's not working. Change your methods. Try to analyze where things go wrong. And the other thing I think that I've begun to learn over the last few years is not to panic and just be more prepared and more aware of what's needed. And I've just organized some things for managing the hives and they seem to be working well. So give yourself a chance and learn from any mistakes and don't panic but have all your gear prepared and ready to go 
One handy hint that I can give any beekeeper is try not to use old brood frames if you're setting up new colonies. But don't they love that? Oh, if the colony that they've come from has failed for some reason and you use brood frames from a failed colony, I think you're only going to get more failed colonies. So I would suggest if you're getting a new colony and try and get the freshest comb that you can and drawn comb and use that. And not from a dead air. Yeah, I, I reckon they're too risky. Okay, the next question is from Maritz. It's a cool name, eh? Yeah. And he says, my hive has absconded. What can he do? Well, get, this get is... Get more bees? <laughs> yeah, you could get more bees, wait till spring, um, buy a nuke. Join the Kiwi Mana Swarm Collector list? Yeah, join the Kiwi Mana Swarm Collectors list and go and get some more. It's quite unusual that a, a whole colony absconds, eh? unless there's something majorly wrong, like a massive mite load. I've seen that. I, I once saw a swarm leaver and a hive that we just put it into a, into a hive. Remember that? That happened once. Yeah. But I've never really seen a whole hive leave. Well, I have. Have you? What What yeah. from? From what was the cause of it? Well, when I went in to have a look at the hive, there was nothing left, basically. She had stopped laying, and to me it looked like it was varroa load when I looked at the remaining cells that, that were there. So the queen was still there then? No, the queen had gone. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so usually when they abscond, they don't leave anything in there that can, they won't leave queen cells, they won't have any eggs in there, they'll just have taken the food that they can and they've left. Usually you go back and there's just honey left in the in the hive and maybe some older brood that they just haven't been able to keep alive. So absconding can be due to a really heavy threat, such as varroa or wasps, and they leave before they fail. And it, sometimes that's around autumn, but sometimes it can be through winter, but then the hives generally don't survive. So a good idea is to keep monitoring the hives to check the load on them, isn't it? Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realise how bad Varroa is in terms of how it threatens a hive and how the, the, the honeybee is quite clever and understands, look, if we stay here getting this threat, we will not survive. So they will just abscond. Other things that can happen is when the cells of the brood are really, really old and they're very thin, or small, because of all the layers of um, bees that have hatched in there, the cell gets too small and then the bees will abscond because they they won't fit, a, um, you know, even a worker brood in there, so they just leave. So, you know, change out old comb. That must be old, isn't it? That is old stuff, but they, they reckon that they sometimes wait till spring for that. But generally they will abscond if there is a big threat and you won't find eggs or queen cells, just honey and just dead brood, basically. Yeah, very sad. Well, sorry to hear about that, Maritz, and hopefully the this coming season is better for you. It could have been prevented by just having more inspections, maybe on a regular basis if you weren't inspecting enough. If they're left to their own devices and they're under threat, then You know, sometimes you won't even know that they're gone. You just suddenly go there and and the hive's been robbed out, but the queen and everybody's just left. Mm. And sometimes you go there and the actual hive box and everything's gone. But that's another kind of absconding, isn't it? (laughs) That's kind of a being removed. That's kind of being stolen. (laughs) (laughs) Moving along. Okay, this one comes from Vina Sevenstay. Stay. Werner, Werner Savenstar. Is the annual beekeeper's calendar for New Zealand, what to do when? Well, the the practical beekeeping guide in New Zealand's got a good calendar, but there's another good resource. It's called the Kiwi Mana Newsletter, which we constantly tell people what we're doing at that time. So obviously we're in Auckland, but you know it's fairly similar around the country, but different temperatures, I guess. I'm not sure where Wiener's from, but uh, what would you recommend? Okay, I think that come along to one of my seasonal beekeeping courses if you can 
and we will talk to you about what's going on and through the seasons and then you can do some planning and understanding. But it is a good question because there is not a lot of New Zealand books that are written for New Zealand conditions. And then you've got the whole uh, anomaly, as it were, for want of a better word, with the different islands. So you've got North Island and South Island. Then you've got, in the North Island, you've got three basic temperature variances that really contribute to what you should be looking at for your highs. And then you go down to the South Island, you have the same thing going on, that there's certain areas which have various temperatures from the top to the bottom. Then what you do have is commercial beekeeping practices versus hobbyist beekeeping practices. So there's quite a few things that you have to look into it. So I think that that is a resource that is lacking. But if you come along to the Kiwimana beekeeping course that does seasonal beehive management, you'll be able to learn about the seasons and the demands of each season and how to deal with it in a hobbyist sense. Absolutely. Thanks, Werner. Well, that's our ideas. We hope you enjoyed this Q&A show and we'll be back in a couple of weeks with a new show for you. If you can add to the conversation as well, please comment below. Yeah, and hearing your views is a good idea because if you share what you do when you have an issue, then it, we can share it with other people as well. So it really does help us all if you give your ideas as well because you might not agree with what we've said and have a better idea. No one disagrees with us. Never. <laughs> Never. Well, absolutely, <laughs> there may be that case. But anyway, if you have a different view, let us know. Yes, and if you've got a question, visit kiwi.bz slash problem and we'll hopefully we'll answer you. Yeah. And then problem solved. Okay, so who brought this show to us? Thanks for listening to our show and thanks to all our supporters who support us through the Patreon service. This week we would like to thank Trish Stretton, Lisa Morrissey, Nathan Buzzinger, Beekeeping, Malcolm Sanford, Goodney Hunter, Barbara Weber, Christopher Brown, Greg Parr. Thanks guys, you are awesome. If you love what we do and find it useful, you can support us too. Visit kiwi.bz slash banana. And the show notes for this Q&A show is kiwi.bz slash 151. Gosh, Gary, we've, we've cracked 150. I know. Awesome. And 150 was such a great show, wasn't it? It was. A, a, it was really fantastic. And you guys will love it. Thanks, guys. And we'll see you next time. See ya! Definitely time for a cuppa.